Good morning, good morning. How are you? Oh, Mrs. Angry's been driving the car. I'm nice and early this morning, so we're going to go ah, the fast way. <laughs> Called you there, didn't I? Fooled you. Thought I was going to say the windy bends, but we're not. So, I hope you're well. It's uh, about a big dose of rain. Oh, I shouldn't have gone this way. Oh, no. We're going to go through the big puddle. Oh, where the, uh, the living testament to the fact that public service, public bodies can't fix anything. Just look at the road for a start. Oh, <laughs> got the bright light <laughs> in my eyes. Makes me sneeze. Family trait. So, we're on the uh, way for some hot weather in the southeast now. So, so if I could just brighten my face up a little bit, seeing as the shadows uh, playing havoc. Hello. They've built the uh, edge of the field up there. Mind you, I suppose they've built the edge of the field up here, haven't they? It's just covered in grass. But back there, they've just uh, restored the edge. I've never seen that before. So, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, service, you know, service levels in primary care. And by primary care, I mean, I, I don't know, usually you mean medicine, don't you, dentistry, whatever. Health care, primary health care. But in fact, uh, primary care, I would say, is any customer-facing job, you know, particularly one in, in a location that people visit, the high street or clinic or whatever. So I had a bit of a funny uh, episode at the opticians the other day. I've got bifocals and uh, they're pretty good for most things, you know, I can't... The, the opticians I go to is an old-fashioned optician, by, by, by old-fashioned, oh that's good, looks like the, uh, the puddle is sort of draining away a bit, um, by which I mean everything's done with a pencil. So, for example, the appointment book's all in, in a big book, in pencil. The uh, uh, notes are on card, and also, from what I can see, kept in pencil. Um, so, in other words, they do it the way I used to do it in the 1980s. And the 1990s, before computers were invented. And... To be honest, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. You have to have some concerns about whether or not they can change records after the event if they're, you know, all their clinical records are, are kept in pencil. But, um, you know, I mean, you can make that sort of system work. Uh, but I'm just wondering, to me, it's a sort of a symptom of a, an approach, which is an approach which is... Uh, Make as much money as possible. Charge as much as possible. Spend as little as possible. That's the... Uh, that's the sort of the general approach. And... Let me just concentrate on this junction. Here we go. Off to the red car. Three, two, one. You know, and a lot of dentists had this approach. Uh, they're, they're the people that you know you you get frustrated with them because they won't spend a penny on anything and they pay the staff peanuts and uh, the the quality of the uh, what they do is they uh, to a certain extent they're relying on the fact that they can charge you know a large amount like 500 pounds for a pair of glasses in a market where you can get a pair of glasses for probably a fifth of that or at least half of that. 
So they're hoping to make up the difference with inertia. In other words, patients not realizing that the market is matured and uh, optical services are commoditized now. And uh, so going to the same, the catering to the same sort of base as uh, British Gas. People who are getting overcharged for what they're receiving, but have, uh, you know their parents were with British Gas and they've been with British Gas all their lives, and they're not about to change now. You know that inertia, uh, and the same with the banks. You know the banks relied on inertia until they were forced to introduce the system where you you can change. You know you just give them your bank account details and and your old bank account details and then within a week they've changed everything across. So and they're in um, Ramsgate which is I would say a deprived area, a depressed area. And so you can imagine they're depressed as well because they're depressed that their model of charging £500 for a pair of glasses uh, and spending no money at all on uh, Infrastructure, computers, software, training, etc., etc. He's not, you know, he's he's a failing system. He's an old system. So anyway, the the issue that I had with them was that I so I've got bifocals, and I, a long time ago I used to wear contact lenses, and so and I rang them up and I said that I'm. You know, I would like, if possible, to wear contact lenses. The idea being that, you know, my, my sight is, I'm short sighted, so I'm okay up to about 60 centimeters. And then, really, what I want is a pair of contact lenses that takes me from 60 centimeters to about 60 yards. Because beyond that, you know, it's, it's the distance, isn't it? So, <laughs> anyway, she said that. Uh, she, she thought I wanted them for social events or I wanted them for sporting events not for day-to-day uh, uh, -day use and certainly not for uh, use with a VR headset which is one of the things I had problem that I had now the thing about a VR headset you would think wouldn't you and it is possible that it's true for some VR headsets but you would think you would be able to focus your eyes in a VR headset in the same way as you can with the binoculars. In other words, they'd have like a little twisty dial on each eye that would correct your vision for the long sight. And it's possible that, as I say, they're the more expensive ones, but I paid about 300 quid for this HP Reverb G2 second hand from CEX Computer Exchange. And, um, it requires that you, you know, you have your sight be corrected. Now you can do it by uh, putting your glasses on underneath the, the headset. But unfortunately, these glasses are too big. And also, because they're bifocals, really, you're not your your vision is perfect in the uh, VR headset. You don't have to accommodate look long distance then short then long then short it's all the same distance it's all focused about an inch away from your eyeballs so really uh, bifocals are no good inside a VR headset so what I did was I paid to have some lenses uh, made up which is like a, you know which would crack my eyesight inside this VR headset and that's a pain because if in a year or two that my, my eyesight changes Oh, not only will I have to get new glasses, I'll have to get uh, new VR lenses made up. But anyway, that's by the by. So, one of the things you do need to do with uh, this uh, headset is that you have to know your, or you have to adjust your interpupillary distance. And that's because the lenses do. Um, move in and out sideways to accommodate people whose eyes are close together and also those people whose, whose eyes are wide apart. So <clears throat> I 
So I'm thinking, well, this is good. You know, I need to know my uh, interpupillary distance, IPD. And I'm just about to go to the opticians and, uh, you know, and so I'll just ask them, they'll know. <laughs> so, anyway, she said to me, oh, you're no, you know, you're not suitable for contact lenses for the reasons that you want them, which is, you know, uh, this is problem number one. She assumed that I wanted them for social or sporting events. She did not think for a second that I wanted to experiment with them as a replacement of my glasses. So basically, I've been made an appointment for um, a reason which was never ever going to fly. You know, it was, you know, it's a bit like when your receptionist says you're your Mrs. So and So coming in, she's got a toothache, and you go, well, okay, what uh, is the what's the problem? You know, what did she say? She's got pain at night. She's got a swelling. What's the you know? Give me like a quick what have you found out so far type thing and the and the patient and then the, the receptionist said well, I don't know she just said she got pain she wanted to come in so I booked her in now that is really not that is substandard work there right that is less than you should expect from a receptionist and uh, you should uh, you know the other thing you can do is you can say well which tooth is it you know is it on the right is it on the left is it up the top down the bottom you don't need to know they don't need to say well it's the upper right second premolar but, you know, you should be able to get a quadrant out of it. And, and a brief summary of the symptoms and a quadrant is what you should be expecting when a patient comes in with toothache. So, they never really uh, asked me on the phone why I wanted contact lenses. And so they come to the conclusion that I wanted them for one of the reasons that they knowing that other people come in and want them for uh, which as it turned out wasn't so as it turned out I ended up getting booked in for an appointment to discuss something that wasn't possible and so and it was a waste of their time and it was a waste of my time as well well that's not the problem the problem was that when I was leaving after they said to me, oh, look, I was the Chinese contingent. After, uh, or South Korean, I don't know. I don't know. They work somewhere. Somewhere that employs exclusively Chinese people. So as I was walking out, I just sort of casually said, oh, by the way, can I, can you tell me what my interpupillary distance is, my IPD? And uh, she said, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't give you that information. And I said, why not? And she said, well, because it's not part of your prescription. It's not, that information is not the information that you get, you're, you're given following an eye check. So I said, oh, okay. But I said back, like, can you give it to me anyway? Even though it's not, you know, officially on your prescription. And she said, no, I can't, no. So <laughs> I said, well, by, by this time, you know, I could sense that this was going seriously awry. Because <laughs> this is like the distance between my eyes. They're my eyes and it's my distance. So... <laughs> Why she should say she can't tell it to me, she can't let me have it, I just couldn't understand. It's one of those things that's so stupid, so stupid, that you're set, it sets you back at the time. You don't understand that later, as you think about it, it's going to get more stupid the more you think about it. I said to her, if I pay you money, will you tell me what they are? <laughs> She said, no, I can't do that. She said, well, she said, it's not a question of money. It's just something that we just don't give away, you know. So, so then, by then, I'd sort of, I'd realised I wasn't, probably wasn't going to get this. So I was, I was, at that point, I must admit, I was started having a bit of fun with her. And I said to her, why, is it a secret? You know, is it, is it like, is it... <clears throat> She's treating this IPD as though it's some sort of 
uh, passcode or PIN number for her credit card and she can't divulge it and she, they're treating it like it's their intellectual property you know that they've got some sort of proprietary interest in my IPD that, that I can't have and I'm not allowed to have my IPD so now I wouldn't mind but you know anyone who's, who's measured an IPD knows it is literally a case of getting someone with a, a clear six inch plastic ruler measured in millimeters to stand in front of you, ask you to focus on, to look at something in the distance, and then to have a little bit of skill about moving your head from side to side to see uh, the, the, you know, what, what the distance is between the pupils. A, the most unskilled person with 30 seconds worth of training could take this measurement. And, and in fact, that is probably how I'm going to do it, you know. Um, and she said to me, well, can't you, um, can't you put these things on and just move the uh, move the knob, you know, and, until it, it feels comfortable? And I said, no, because the problem is that it all feels comfortable. You know, it's not it's not like a binoculars where, where you're focusing and then all of a sudden it's in focus and you're slightly out of focus and you move it back and then it's in focus. Oh, and then you've gone too far and you have to move it back the other way again. Oh no, I made a huge error here. Huge. Oh no. I forgot to cut through. I'm on the back of a huge queue here. I wonder if I can go down through, oh, I'm too late to go down through Cliff's End even now. Because I've got a car right on my butt. And this is not a roundabout. You can't go round it. Oh, well. You and me are going to be um, talking to each other for a while here now. That's what I should be doing. Should be coming in on my motorbike. Anyway, just let me finish this story off. So, so anyway, so I didn't get my IPD. She just told me to fiddle. And I said, no, I don't want to fiddle about with it. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm thinking she's my optician. I'm asking for something really, really stupidly simple, like my IPD. She won't give it to me. There's sometimes you just can't get things. I mean, people will just say no. Do you know what I mean? People, uh, they, they reserve the right to be unreasonable. And so uh, sometimes you just have to say, look, okay, you're being stupid, you're being unreasonable, but I can't stop you, you know? I was once, um, I was once on the Parent Teachers Association, and this was in the days really before the internet, and uh, if the school was shut, what happened was the teacher would uh, ring uh, two or three other people, and they had like a a tree of people uh, where those three or four people would ring in turn three or four other people who would ring three or four other people and um, and and as a result all the parents would get informed that the school was shut well I mean we never really used it but it, the um, one day the person who was supposed to be ringing me just said that they were not going to be bothering to ring you know that they would once they knew that the school was shut then they were not really going to do anything else they're not going to tell anyone else they didn't want the the bother of ringing three or four other people so they would just say thanks very much and not not participate so which obviously put me at a severe disadvantage didn't it and all the people who relied upon me and it was totally unreasonable but there's nothing I could do, you know, that you cannot force these people to be sensible or clever. They are, if they want to be moronic, they will achieve it. This house, the, these, this bed of trees here, is very odd because all around here is fields. And there's just this little bit of land here which has got trees all over it. 
And the reason it's got trees all over it is because uh, the land belongs to two houses which were uh, are still here either side. You can probably just see on the right there the chimney of the house on the right. And I think the one on the left um, belonged to the wrestler Jackie Palo. And if you are my age, 60s, and uh, you know, were a big fan of wrestling on the BBC in the afternoon, or was it ITV? Uh, in the days of black and white, Jackie Palo was a forerunner of The Rock, you know, a big, um, uh, the, rock, the Rock is a wrestler, is he? I don't know. Anyway, this, it, was, it, was the, it was the really, really early stages of the WWF. And I'm not talking about the World Wildlife Foundation, I'm talking about the, what, the wrestling people. Uh, Jackie Palo, yeah, was uh, very, very famous, and this was his house. And then, uh, and then when he died, he sort of, um, I don't know what happened to it. Nobody moved in and the whole place started falling apart and the garden started going mad, which is why the trees are all uh, 80 foot high. And so this is known as Jackie Palo's house. So, so what do you do, you know? I mean, the thing is, if I, you know, I could, I could, there's several ways I can respond. One is that I can just say to up with this, I will not put, and just find myself another optician. You know, there's the, you may as well. I mean, you know, God knows enough people have found themselves another dentist if I've fallen out with them or they've fallen out with me. I mean, I don't think I would. I'm accommodative, you know. I wouldn't fall out with them over. I mean, it's a bit like someone coming in and saying to me, how many fillings have I got? And I'm saying, no, I can't tell you because uh, the number of fillings is not something we put in our quotes. You know, we put down, we give you a chart showing the fillings that you've got and we give you a, uh, a treatment plan and quotation, but we don't give away the number of fillings. I mean, it's just, that's how absurd it is. And that's how absurd it was at the time. And even the receptionist was laughing. When I said, is it a secret? She laughed. I don't think she could really understand what this optician was was doing, you know, what they what she was trying to achieve. The, um, she was, she said twice, she said, oh, well, I suppose I could, I could try and get permission to, to give it to you. Now, it occurred to me that this optician was a locum. And this is a group with sort of three or four surgeries locally, you know, sort of Folkestone, Dover, Ramsgate, whatever, Canterbury perhaps. And and so and so as a result, uh, you know, it may be that they've got a load of opticians, locum opticians that go round and just perhaps perhaps they've only got one contact lens person. And that contact lens person goes around everywhere. One, one day a week in each practice or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so, because I, I certainly hadn't seen her before and she wasn't the person who did my eye test. But even if I put in a SAR, what I call a search and rescue, a subject, subject access request, that really, you know, and you're like, well, that'll show them. I'll get the information. I'll just ask for all my information. And it's bound to be on there. But... In fact, that really only applies to um, uh, computer records. You know, the Information Commissioner's Office uh, is concerned with uh, the harm that comes from uh, data uh, breaches and, and data manipulation and data loss and abuse of data. And it's very hard with written records. You know, how do you, how do you say I want to a list of all my patients who are, you know, single and between 20 and 30, if um, if you have to do it, if you have to go through a thousand paper records to find them, uh, when you can do it in two seconds on a... Come on, what are you waiting for? I'm going to have to beep her in a minute. I don't know what she's waiting for. Come on, move along. 
KP60 UTX. Thank you. You're a small person in a small car. Just terrible. Thank you so much. Who dares wins? So, uh, oh, look at this, and the lights are green. Fortune favours the brave. This is going on. This this bit is going on till the end of the month, I think. They're building a new entrance for these new houses on the left. The actual roundabout that we've just gone over is um, going on till the end of the year, first of December. I think they're going to uh, have that finished in time for people to be able to get down here to get to Westwood Cross, which is the big shopping centre at the end of the road. So I could get to my work if I could turn right down there, but then they make their no right turn. So it doesn't matter, I'll get there some other way. Come on, Mr. Fencing Contractor. Oh, you could have gone then, couldn't you? So that's, you know, this is my This, this goes to just goes to reinforce what I always say about business. You don't have to be good to be good at business. You just have to be not rubbish. And so this optician who's using the overcharge scrimp on 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 capital investment and and sort of make a nice fat living off the middle is going to find that they're going to just going to get starved of customers because I'm going somewhere else. I'll just go somewhere else that's got a bit of vitality. Somewhere that's prepared to treat me as a person. You know, someone that's prepared to, some, someone that doesn't have to refer upwards to three chain, you know, three levels in the chain of command to do something like tell a patient what the distance is between their own eyeballs. I'll try somewhere else, and uh, you know they can go. They can go the way of a lot of dentists, who are not very uh, don't understand service. You know, don't understand, can't interact with people. This is the problem. I really honestly think with locums, they don't. You know, they really they just don't uh, gel with people. It's very sort of what's the service level agreement. I'll I'll stick to that, you know. I'm, I'm very bureaucratic. I'll stick to the rule book about what I've been told to do, how I've been told to work, you know. These are people that are not really got enough um, up here to run their own business. So they're working for someone else and they, they uh, just have to do what they're told, which is not what I want. Anyway, all right. Nice to talk to you. Bye.